We celebrate the 4th of July for the uh, Declaration of Independence that America has experienced. And, and so celebrate that day by remembering this, those who have given their lives. Amen? I guess somebody lit a fire under Linda today. <laughs> But she was saying what was in my mind. And uh, I didn't tell her to say that. But what? Oh, everybody's wondering about this. I have to go like this because it doesn't look right if I hold it up the other way. <laughs> they might think I'm doing a uh, bad thing. Uh, I want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you. I, I hyperextended my finger. That's why I wasn't playing the, today. Uh, I, I can't touch anything. But you know something? Uh, I got it wrapped up, and I got a little metal piece. that You know the things for your collar that you put in the collar? I have metal ones. And so I put it on there because I couldn't find anything else. But it works, except when I'm banging it into doors and handles and stuff like that. And No, it's crazy. But anyway, but uh, we're glad to have you here this morning. Amen. God is good, and yeah, God is on the throne. And uh, it's serious. The enemy wants to see us killed and destroyed, and he wants to... Uh, take away everything he can from us that that uh, comes our way. But God is greater. Greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. And so I thank God for that. And I thank God for what he's doing in our church and what he's doing in our life. And I thank God for Monday night prayer. I'm telling you, it's been a blessing. It's been a blessing, but it's been hard. Come on now. Let's be honest now. It's hard to uh, get done with work and come in on Monday and uh, come in on here at but when you come in here, how many have been blessed when they get here? Amen. Amen. The presence of the Lord is in this place. And so we thank God for that. And, and the enemy's mad, but we're glad. Hallelujah. You know, and uh, uh, when the, this happened to my finger, it just kept throbbing and throbbing and throbbing. You know, I hyperextended it. I threw a case of water into Linda's uh, trunk area. And you know how they have the plastic wrapped around the, the bottles of water? Well, my finger got stuck up inside the the plastic, and when I threw it in, it hyperextended my finger back. So it is painful, but uh, praise God, amen. I'll try not to um, do things to make it look funny, so I'll just kind of hold the mic that way I can talk with this hand. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, good to be with you this morning. Uh, the, the background you're seeing right there is from the Sea of Galilee. That's where Linda and I were. And uh, up on the hillside where all the lights are, that's the, that's the little town of Tiberias you read in the Bible. And we were there. We spent the night there in a hotel there, and it was wonderful uh, to be in the places of Capernaum and being in Tiberias. And, and the, we sailed on the Sea of Galilee just like Jesus did and just like the disciples did. It was wonderful to be there. And... Uh, the, the title of my message, as you saw, was The Storms on the Sea of Galilee. And I, I want you to understand that uh, there is a natural and there is a spiritual. Amen? And when I read that about the storms of Galilee this morning, I started to think about the storms of life. The storms of Galilee is a place. It's a literal place. And we have storms in life that are literally happening to us. And I believe that we're doing something right when the devil's attacking. I didn't get an amen. I got a yes, a yes, but no amen. Well, it's an amen because that we know we're doing something right. The devil will leave you alone when everything is going okay. But I want you to know when you're doing stuff and you're starting to get into spiritual growth and you're starting to get into revival and you're starting to confess your sins and you're starting to get right with God, the enemy doesn't like that because he knows that something's going to happen. Something's going to break through the atmosphere. Something's going to break through in your life. Something's going to break through in your family. Hallelujah. And the devil gets angry at that and he gets mad at that. But I'm glad that we're doing this, and I'm glad that we're taking the steps necessary. If you have your Bibles with me, uh, with you, I'm sorry, please, uh, I have my Bible with me, I don't know if you have your Bible with you, but uh, turn to the book of Matthew, please, the book of Matthew, chapter 8, uh, starting with verse 23, and I want to just start and stop with verse 23 for a moment. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you. We praise you. God, I pray that you gather my thoughts together today, Lord, and let me be able to present this message 
God, in the way that you want it so that it will feed your people. That God, they will grow and they will take it and they will chew on it and they will meditate upon it, God, and they will apply it, God, and they will use it for uh, whatever situation they may be facing. I thank you and I praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And verse 23 says, And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. Now, the word ship there doesn't mean the ideology that we have of a ship. When we think of a ship, we think of a huge ship. But I want you to see something. I, I, I found uh, uh, that uh, picture that I saw of a, of a ship during the time of Jesus. They found this in the, buried under the sand in the Sea of Galilee. It's from around the 40th century B.C., so right around the time of 40 to maybe 40 years in between there, they found this ship buried in the sand in the sea. And it took them uh, about three days to be able to um, get it out and, and preserve it. And it took 12 years to actually preserve it before they could show it on, in a museum. Uh, Pastor, would you put that up there, please? This is about the size of the ship that was there. And I'll give you the dimensions of it. The ship was 27 feet long. It's about maybe a little bit this way, maybe just a little couple of feet. I think this is 24, if I'm not mistaken, or 25. So three more feet, seven and a half feet wide, and about a height about up to here, maybe four foot three inches. Maybe you could fit 12 people in there, 13 the most, uh, not, on, not counting the amount of fish that you would catch. But it was a very small boat in comparison. When you saw that boat that we saw in the opening with my message on it, that boat, uh, I think it seats about 150. So that's a pretty big boat. And that boat in that video was going pretty up and down. You saw the waves. And a storm can happen on the Sea of Galilee just like that. We were on the Sea of Galilee. The sun was shining and everything was nice. And all of a sudden it got dark. And all of a sudden it started getting wavy. That storm from the mountains, that wind comes down from the mountains around that area, and it settles down at the sea, and it causes up a stir. And I'm telling you, it's quite a storm. The Bible says here, well, let me, let me just give you a little background on, the, on, the, on the, the historical importance of that boat that I just showed you. The Galilee boat is historically important to the Jews and is an example of a type of boat that was used by their ancestors in the first century for both fishing and transportation across the, the Sea of Galilee. That's what they used to go back and forth. So understand that when we think of a ship, you know, we're not thinking of a, a luxury line, and we're not thinking of, a, of a, like the ship like the pilgrims. We're talking about a, a, a boat okay, that you had to row. There was no motors, so they had to row this boat across there. And here the Bible says that when he, Jesus, was entered into his ship, his disciples followed him. Now, it's very interesting. When it talks about the sea, it's talking, of course, about the Galilee Sea. And in the Hebrew, the word Galilee means to put trust in. To put trust in. Now, isn't that amazing? They're getting into a ship with the, with the Lord and they're in Ga on the Sea of Galilee, and the word Galilee means to put your trust in. Or it also means to commit yourself to. That's what the word Galilee means. So when they entered into the ship, his disciples followed him. Think about that for a moment. They were going to cross this Sea of Galilee. Many of them were fishermen. I believe there were five. There were actually five disciples that were from the area of the Sea of Galilee, whether they were from Capernaum or Tyre or whatever they were, or Tiberias, wherever they were from. But there were five disciples from that area, and they were used to going across the Sea of Galilee and traveling that sea, and they knew about storms and they knew about these things. 
But it says when he entered the ship, his disciples followed him. Now, you and I both know that in order to follow Jesus, it takes this one little word, trust. Because you don't know where he's going to lead you. Amen. You don't know where he may lead you. And so you have to trust him. I can tell you in all my missionary journeys, it always took a trust in God's sovereignty and God's omniscience and God's omnipotence of knowing that everything is under his control. And when I went on that mission trip to India the first, uh, second time, no, first time with uh, Brother K Kalanda Vilu, I kissed my wife. I was gone for six weeks. Not knowing if we'd come back. Not knowing if I'd come back. That takes trust. Amen. Not, not, not come back because I didn't want to. <laughs> okay. But because of situations and circumstances. So it takes a trust when God is saying, follow me. And then Jesus says to us, he says, follow me. For where I am, there you shall be also. So he gives us a promise in that if we will follow him, that even though we may go through things in life, and even though we may be persecuted or, or, or experience difficulties, Jesus says that he'll always be with us, and he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And so based on his word, you can trust. Have you ever met somebody you can trust? Have you ever met anyone you can't trust? <laughs> Well, there's I bet you there's more people that you can't trust than people that you can trust. Okay? But how do you know when you can trust someone? You can trust someone when they give you their word. And they follow through on their word. Well, Jesus gave his word. And he followed through with his word. All the way up until Stephen was stoned. And he was being stoned for the sake of the gospel. And he looked up to heaven and he said, Lord, lay not this sin upon their charge. And the Bible says that Jesus stood up. He was seated at the right hand of the Father, but he stood up to welcome Stephen into the kingdom. He was even with Stephen during that time of persecution. Because it says his, angel, his face shone like an angel. The presence of God. And I believe there's a special grace that God gives to those who are martyred and killed for his name. And when he was entered into a ship on the Sea of Galilee, I'm going to paraphrase that because that's where they were. A place where they would put their trust in him. A place where they would commit themselves to him. And in that place of security, in that place of serenity, verse 24 comes to play. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea. Insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves. Now you saw the size of the boat. And I'm telling you, that sea kicks up just like that. It was such a great storm that the ship was covered with the waves. You ever go through anything in life like that? Do you ever go through things and problems and situations and circumstances in life that you feel like it's just so overflowing, it's so overwhelming, that you feel flooded, that you feel like it's sinking, everything is going wrong, everything is falling apart, then you're covered with this sense of wanting to give up. 
How many felt that, ever felt that way? I feel that way this morning. You say you do? Absolutely. I felt like I didn't want to be here today. I felt I wanted to go do something else. But I'm here because I'm following Jesus and not myself. Following myself, it'd be nice to be at the beach. Following myself, it'd be nice to be having a nice snack or a nice something to eat in the morning. And going to the beach and sitting at, by the beach and watching the ocean and hearing the ocean. Sounds nice. But this is what's called accountability and responsibility. I belong here. And when the tempest rose and came against the ship, and many of you, if you're honest with yourselves, know that when you go through these trials, when you go through the batterings of life, when you go through the waves that are overpowering you, you feel like Jesus is asleep. You feel like he's not conscious of your situation. You feel that he has somehow abandoned you or left you or is just letting you go through this alone. This is what the disciples were feeling. Matthew records it, he says, but he, Jesus, was asleep. He was asleep. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not too much of a heavy sleeper. I'm a little light sleeper. Amen. And Jesus was asleep. He must have been real tired. Because the Bible says that the waves were coming into the ship. The waves were overpowering the ship to the point where it was causing the disciples to be in an erratic state. They started to panic. But Jesus was asleep. In the most difficult times of your life, in the most serious times in your life. You will go through the battle. You go through the floods. You go through distress. You go through all of the perplexities of life. And you will feel at times that Jesus is asleep. That he's not conscious of your situation. And in verse 25... Before we do go to 25, let me just say this. Let's look at Psalm 22, verse 8. While you're looking at that, I want to welcome our pastor, Josias, and his wife. God bless you for visiting with us today. Good to have you with us. Psalm 22, verse 8 says this. He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighteth in him. So those that delight in the Lord, the Lord will deliver them. That's the promise of the scripture. He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. 
Had the disciples known this scripture, they wouldn't have panicked so, far, so much. Psalm 37 verse 5. Psalm 37 verse 5. Hallelujah. Then went out to him Jerusalem. No. You got three five. Thirty seven five. It says commit. That's a word in America people don't like. Commitment. How do you know, Pastor? Because four out of five marriages end in divorce. <laughs> Come on. He says, commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him. What will happen? It, he shall bring it to pass. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him. And he shall deliver you. He shall bring it to pass. Now go back to Matthew. And his disciples, verse 25, and his disciples came to him and awoke him. Saying, Lord, save us, we perish. Lord, save us, we perish. How did he know they were going to perish? Think about this. I, when I read this, this is what I think about. Lord, how did they know they were going to perish? They don't know the future. They can assume because of the circumstances, because of what they're seeing, the boat is filling with water. Maybe if they had a water letter outer. Remember the three stooges? They had the, 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 the uh, drill. And they would, they, their boat filled with water, so they made holes so the water could go out. But it gets, kept sinking and sinking. So they woke up Jesus, they woke him up, they, 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 they physically went over, shook him. And all this time he's sleeping. And don't we shake the heavens, when we cry out to God and say, don't you care that we perish, Lord? Save us. Save me out of this situation. Save me from these circumstances. Save me, Lord. I'm, I'm in terrible trouble, and I need your help. Proverbs 16, verse 3. This is why it's so important to get the word in your heart, in your spirit. Because when you get the word in your spirit, that's verse 2, right? I want verse 3. Commit is that word again. Commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts thy thoughts shall be established you must commit the works unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established Now go back to Matthew. But I want you to understand something. The disciples were fulfilling the works of Christ. 
He told them, get in the ship. They got in the ship with him. We read just in Proverbs, commit thy works unto the Lord. He'll establish your thoughts. When Jesus first began in this scripture, in this context, he said something in verse 18 when his disciples were there. Now when Jesus saw the great multitudes that were about him, he gave commandment to what? To, yeah, but what? Depart unto the other side. Jesus was giving the commandment, not a suggestion. He told them, we're going to depart unto the other side, which means that Jesus had every intention of that boat making it to the other side. Are you following me? So Jesus spoke the word the prophetic word of what was going to take place with that ship. And he said, listen, I'm giving you this commandment to depart unto the other side. Now, let me ask you this question. Is Jesus a liar? Does he know the future? He knows all things. And he told them, you get in that boat and you go to the other side. Now, they got in the boat, but something happened along the way. And many of you are saying, oh yeah, Pastor, I know the storm came. No, 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 no. They forgot the word. Go to the other side. They forgot the word that Jesus said, go to the other side. Why do you think Jesus was asleep? Well, he was tired. But what else do you think he, why he was asleep? Because he knew his word was his word. That his word would not return void unto him. He spoke the word, we're going to go to the other side. And his disciples came to him, woke him up, saying, Lord, save us. We perish. If I can phrase it in our terminology. Jesus, what the heck are you doing sleeping? Get up. We're going to die. <coughs> Don't you care about us? Don't you love me? How many times do we go through things, we say that to God. God, don't you love me? God, are you awake? Do you hear my prayer? Where are you, God? I don't see you anywhere. Can I tell you where he is? He's right there with you. Either Jesus is who he said he was, or he's not. He told the disciples, he says, Lo, I am with you. Some of the time, maybe... On different occasions. Is that what he said? He said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the earth. I'm with you. <laughs> Praise God. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. When you go through the fire, you won't be burned. When you go through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. But sometimes we don't take God at his word. He said, look, you're going to make it to the other side. Don't worry. I have no worries. I'm going to sleep. <laughs> but isn't it something in the midst of crisis, in the midst of our life, when we're going through the battle, we so lean we so lean upon our feelings and emotions. And God says, no. You walk not by, by sight, but by faith. 
Faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You can't see it. You can't see it. You can't see the end result. But I know whom I have believed in and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him until that day. Oh, Rabba Shakarabahada. He's able to keep it. God keeps his promise. And so when Jesus is awakened in verse 26, he said to them, Why are ye, what? Fearful. Why are you fearful? Can I tell you, That the number one enemy to faith is fear. The moment you are experiencing any type of fear or any kind of threat or any kind of attack in the human body and in the human psyche it's called flight or fight response you will either run or you'll fight when Las Vegas went through that shooting a few months back when the people heard and saw the people falling dead that flight or fight kicked in. Most of them, they flew. They took off. But the first responders, they have been trained to harness their fear. And some of them not even Christian. But they harness that fear and they fight. They run toward the danger. Firemen are the same way. People in their house is on fire, they run out of the house. Firemen, when they show up on the scene, they run into the house. We develop that through our experiences in life. Where we respond, and many times we respond in fear. But here in this case, Jesus says, why are you so fearful? You're allowing the emotion of fear to take over your thoughts. You're allowing the emotion of fear to take over your decision making. You're allowing this fear to cause you to run rather than stand and fight. The Bible says, if God be for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, we can stand and we can stand on the promise and say, I don't care what it looks like. We're going to fight this battle to the end. Because God is on my side. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. I'm going to stand. Now that doesn't mean you don't experience any fear. Hello? You're going to experience fear, but you're not going to let fear paralyze you to not respond. You're going to go fearing. You may be shaking a little bit like this, but you're going to move forward. I'm going to move forward, God. I'm not going to run. Oh, that's a big Goliath. But I'm going forward. Why are you so fearful? Jesus nailed that right on the head.
the enemy to trust. They were on the Sea of Galilee. Galilee meaning putting your trust in him. <laughs> the very place they were spoke of trust. And yet they allowed fear to take over. And then he said, O oh, ye of little faith. Let me explain this to you. This little faith was, was based upon verse 18. Let us go to the other side. They had little faith. They didn't believe that. Because they were looking at the circumstances of the ship overflowing with water. And they said, in the natural, they said, it's impossible. We're not going to make it. The ship is too much water to make it to the other side. But they didn't say, you know what? With man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Even a ship filled with water can make it to the other side. They didn't have faith in what Jesus said. Didn't he say, we'll go to the other side? Ninety-nine point nine percent of our problem is we don't believe this. Ninety-nine point nine percent. We say we believe. But when the battle gets hot, when the battle gets tough, we forget what God said. When you go through the storms of life, when you go through the battles, and we've all gone through them, we've all gone through situations, circumstances, where we're, the enemy has really come in and wrecked havoc in our life. But God was aware of it. God takes us through it. And when we come through it, when we pass the test, Joe, we come out like a polished shaft in the hand of God. We come out more humble. We come out with more reverence and respect. And we say, God, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, listen to me now, I will fear no evil. Why? Because thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. What's the rod? The rod is is used for correction. Read it in Proverbs. The rod is used for correction. Whom the Lord loves, he corrects. If you ever get corrected by God, you should rejoice. Because you should say, you know what? God loves me. He's not leaving me to be illegitimate. He's correcting me. He's instructing me. And that shows me that he loves me. And the staff was used to guide the sheep if they go astray. The little crook on it. Go over and grab that sheep and pull them back in. So what he's saying is, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Your guidance and your correction brings a satisfy to me. They comfort me. And then he goes on and he says this. And the Lord shall prepare a table. What do you do at a table? You feast. You relax. You fellowship. He says, I will prepare a table for you in the presence of your enemies. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Though your enemies may rejoice now, they won't always rejoice forever. God will make you a table to sit at, to fellowship, and to rejoice, and to have joy in the presence of your enemies. And they'll wonder, how could that person have joy after going through this battle? After going through the trial and the tribulation that they've gone through, yet they've not lost their joy. They've not lost their, their, their happiness in God. Because they didn't let fear creep in. Amen. They didn't let fear creep in. It says, then he arose and he rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm. Was there any doubt? <laughs> Understand, you're not in this walk alone. Understand that. You're not on this walk alone. But again, feelings, sometimes we feel we're alone. Sometimes we feel like we're going through these things all alone. And the devil comes. Nobody loves you. Nobody cares about you. And he starts talking to you. Look what they've done to you. Look at how they treat you. That's when you have to let faith arise. You have to understand you're not in this walk alone. To Jesus, though you don't see him. Hallelujah. Even better. Can I tell you something even better? Even better than Jesus. <gasps> Everybody's eyes are, oh, better than Jesus. Yes. Jesus said to his disciples, it is expedient for you that I go away. It's for your benefit I'm going away. But I'm not leaving you comfortless. I am going to send to you the comforter. And he will be upon you, he shall be in you, and he shall be with you. In the Greek, his Name is Parakritos. I have to do it with this hand. It means that he's someone that comes beside you. This is what the original meaning in the Greek. And he gets you by the hand. And he walks with you. That's the Parakritos in the Greek. The comforter. He holds you by your hand through the trials, tribulations, persecutions, the storms of life. But he's invisible. You don't see him. But he wants you to know that he's got you by the hand. Oh, Rabba Shikaba. He has you by your hand. We used to sing that old hymn. And he walks with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there. None other will ever know yes he walks with me and he talks with me he's the paracletos grabbing you by your hand and leading you down the road let me say this, in the church of today, 
the Holy Spirit leads you down the road less traveled. People say, how do you know the Holy Spirit will lead you down what road? The road the Holy Spirit will lead you down is the road that is narrow. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. The Holy Spirit will not lead you that way. He'll lead you in the narrow way. What's narrow about it? It's so narrow that your opinions can't fit through. It's so narrow that your ideas can't fit through. Only his way. His thoughts. He says in his word, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways. For my ways and my thoughts are higher than yours. So when you pray and you're in a dilemma, you're going through the battle and you pray and you don't see an immediate result, do you give up? Or do you go by what God has said? What did he say? He's able. That's why you got to get that word in you. He's able to do exceedingly. Say the word exceedingly. Abundantly, above all that I could ask. Think about that. Now that's God's word. So if God says that he's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask, help me, Lord, I need your help. He is able. To do. He is able to do. He's able to do. He'll make a way where there is no way. Because he's a miracle worker. Promise keeper. Light in the darkness. Our God, that is who you are. We sing that song. Way maker. Promise keeper. Light in the darkness. Come on. He is able to keep that which you commit to him. Remember I, I told you in Proverbs, commit thy works unto the Lord. And he will establish your thoughts. Commit your works unto the Lord. He'll establish your thoughts. And so Jesus stands up and he rose up and he rebuked the winds and the sea, and they were calmed. Verse 27 says, But when the men marveled, but the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? What this is telling you and I, is that God has control over the natural elements. God has control over the natural elements. God can step in and change your situation just like that. Just like that. Why? Because he's an on-time God. He's an on-time God. You don't have to fear. You don't have to fear. Come on, somebody. You don't have to fear. You don't have to fear. One of the other reasons in the context here that there was such an opposition of trying to stop the work of Jesus reaching the other side. Verse 28. 
Because deliverance was coming. Oh, And when he was come to the other side, into the country of the Gernicians, there met him two possessed with devils. Coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass that way. Can I tell you, when you're in the right place with God, when you're walking with God, there's deliverance on the other side. The devil knows it, he'll try to stop. That's why Monday night prayer, we've been experiencing revival in this place. We come to this altar, we don't ask God for things, we don't ask God for blessings, we don't ask God to uh, move upon this person or that person, we ask God for himself. That's it, we're just seeking God for him, for the manifestation of his presence. And every Monday he's shown up. People are at the altar, they're weeping, they're crying out to God, repenting of sin, getting right with God. That's revival! It's not holding a sign outside the building saying revival this week. It's when the people of God begin to look internally and let the light of God shine upon their hearts and say, God, I'm not living right in this area. I'm not doing this right. I don't have right attitude. I don't have this. I, I've been slacking off on this. I've been slacking off on that. And as you come to the altar and you begin to repent before God, then God begins to breathe his spirit and revive that which is dead. Adam laid there in the dust until God breathed into him the breath of life. Not only does God have the breath to breathe in the natural, he also has the breath to breathe in the spiritual. That's when we're born again. He breathes into us and our spirit man comes alive again. It's resurrected again. Come on, somebody. Say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Are you going through a storm? Are you going through some difficulties? Some perplexities in your life? Do you think you won't make it to the other side? Jesus says, come into the ship. Go to the other side. Come into the ship. Go to the other side. And then when they make it to the other side, they see a situation where demons are coming out of the tombs. <laughs> you can't have fear. Even when you see the enemy through people coming at you. You can't fear. I remember a good friend of mine. He was facing a situation. And understand, when the devil comes, he comes with three things. Intimidation. Manipulation and domination. He comes with those three things to manipulate, to dominate. Come on, somebody. He comes to do those to you and I. And he comes to intimidate us. Where's your God now? You went through all of this, but where's your God now? <laughs> The enemy comes in like that. You need to tell him where your God is. He lives within you. He is upon you. He's with you. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If God is for us, who can be against us? Get in the ship. 
Stay with Jesus. There's a song called The Anchor Holes. The Anchor Holes. Through the storms, the anchor holds. But the anchor has to go deep. It has to hit the bottom and it has to drag along the bottom till it catches on to something. And let me tell you, the greatest storms will not move that ship. I'm anchored in Jesus. No storm or window wave. Come on. You got to stay anchored to Jesus. Anchored to his word. Committed to his ways. Commit thy works unto the Lord. He'll establish your thoughts. Any of us, our thoughts go running wild at times. And we don't know which way to turn left or right. That's the time you do this. If you don't know where to go, if you don't know to, whether to turn left or right and you're in a situation, you know what to do? Do what the Bible says. Having done all to stand, stand. I'm not going left. I'm not going right. God, I'm going to stand right here. I'm not making any emotional decisions. God, I'm standing on the promises of God. I'm standing on your word. I'm standing on what you said. And I'm going to fight the good fight of faith. Can I tell you, many Christians today are defeated because they do not yield the shield of faith. The shield of faith shall quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. Every single one. What's the shield of faith? Is it a real shield? No. This is the shield of faith right here. Devil says, you're going to die. Devil you liar. The word says, I shall live. And even if I was to die in the physical, guess what? I'm still going to be alive in the spirit. Absent from the body to be present with the Lord. Hallelujah. Devil will tell you you're going to die and you're going to not make it. Guess what? He's able to keep that which you commit to him until that day. If you don't commit it, guess what? No guarantee. So I'm going to close my message this morning. And I'm going to close with a sister that's singing a song on the video. And if you want me to pray for you, I'm going to have you come up and stand up here. And I'm going to pray with you. Sometimes, sometimes when we go through a battle, we get battle weary. Amen? Sometimes we get battle weary. Moses got battle weary. And he had Aaron. Who was the other guy? Caleb? Who was the other guy? Aaron and that held up his arms. Her, was it? Aaron and her held, held up his arms. Come on, you Bible scholars, you should know. Linda, you should know. You love that book of Moses. I think it was Aaron and her that held up his arms in the battle. And every time he held that, every time he held that thing up, they won. And every time his arms came down and got tied, they would lose the battle. Sometime you may need a little help. And so I'm going to have our brother pray. And we're going to say God bless you to those who are watching by Facebook. While that's playing, I want you to have your heads bowed. I want you to listen to the song, and then it's going to be repeated. And if you need prayer, come up.